Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join us for our webinar. Uh, this health equity webinar is focusing on food access and policy. My name is Lilia Mehran. I'm the health equity scholar in residence for the National Urban League. I'll be filling in for Lydia Isaac today as moderator. I am joined by our two wonderful panelists, uh, Ms. Jillian Griffith and Dr. Leija Carter. Uh, Ms. Griffith is a registered dietitian and public health professional with experience in strategic private part public partnership and corporate responsibility. She serves as the senior health partnerships manager for Amazon Access, a team focused on designing and implementing retail products and services to meet the needs of customers at a lower income level. And we're also joined by Dr. Leija Carter, who's the CEO and founder of the Coalition for Food and Health Equity which builds power within communities through sustainable community-grown cultures of health. CFHE places hunger within the larger context of racial health equity, working to end hunger, improve health, and advance economic equity within historically marginalized communities. I encourage you, if you haven't had a chance already, to read their longer bios. We're, we're happy to have them. They're two very impressive folks, so please take a moment to do that if you haven't. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to jump right into the conversation. So what are some of the inequities in food access that BIPOC communities face, and in particular, Black Americans? I'm happy to hop in. Um, and I think maybe we should ground ourselves on food access and how that's defined food insecurity. And so so um, just so we're all using like the same language, I typically use uh, the definition um, offered up by the USDA. So the USDA defines food insecurity as a lack of consistent access to enough food for every person in a household to live an active, healthy life. And I think it's important to acknowledge this can be a temporary situation. Um, you know, food, so a family could or a household could experience food insecurity one day, um, and maybe not the next, or it can last a long time. Um, the USDA leads an annual survey of households um, to measure food insecurity. So when we look at food insecurity and its impact on Black um, households specifically, in 2021, which is the most recent year for which the, for which the USDA data is available, it's nearly 20% of Black individuals live in a food insecure household compared to 7% of white households. So this means that one in five black, black households had difficulty at some time during the year providing enough food for all their members because of lack of resources. That's three times, so like these numbers are very drastic. Like these, that's three times more black than white households who are struggling to feed. Um, and so I think, you know, just, as we look at these disparities, there's a lot um, that you know lends to the disparities, but I just want to make sure that we're all grounded in, in what that definition is and how it is unequally impacting Black households. Yeah, um, you know, Jillian hit the nail on the head. I mean, when we're when we're talking about disparities in Black households, and you know, the thing about food insecurity, which I'm sure we'll like pull at this thread even further as we we get even deeper into the discussion. This is this is also based on reporting and and data, right? And you know who gets the the opportunity to report, how information is accessed. And so we know that these numbers that the USDA shares and and, and other reporting organizations get get access to we know those that those statistics are higher essentially right we know that that number is higher um uh and in general we know that black americans uh uh in, in addition to our indigenous folks and our hispanic folks uh report the largest numbers of food insecurity um in this nation um, and when we when we're thinking about what are the drivers of food insecurity, we have to think about things like poverty. Uh, black high households have the highest rate of poverty, unemployment, um, are the least um, are the least uh, are the demographic with the lowest rate of 
of access to home ownership, right? And so we have to look at the systems around, the systems that drive food insecurity in order to understand why Black households are not able to have that consistent access to the food, the nutrition they need in order to live healthy. Yeah. And when we look at those social drivers of health, which is, uh, you know, another uh, social, um, term that I've come across recently, um, kind of the social determinants of health, but thinking about like those drivers, Dr. Carter, to your point, uh, for all of those different systems, when we look at the health impact um, of households in, you know, facing food insecurity, people who are food insecure, the data shows are more likely to have hypertension, heart disease, stroke, cancer. Um, all of these chronic diseases that we know really um, plague and impact um, Black households. And so many, if not all, of these diseases are truly disproportionately impacting communities of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you bringing up social determinants of health, which has come up quite a bit in our webinars. Um, across many topics and um, you know I, I think you both touched on factors that um, may be deterministic or contributing towards um, food insecurity. Um, I also wonder if you could maybe speak to what how food insecurity may then exacerbate other factors that may come up. So, you know, this kind of feedback loop that may exist. Um, can you speak to that? So basically what beyond health even, what does food insecurity, what, what are some of the impacts that it may have on someone's life and, and communities? You know, when I hear that question, um, what comes up for me is like, what's the connection between someone who's experiencing food insecurity and their mental health, right? And so, uh, and then also when we're thinking of children, what is the impact of food insecurity on development, right? On learning, on cognitive, on cognitive, emotional, and social development. So that's the that's the link that I I see. Um, and so I'll I guess I'll position my thoughts there. And so when someone doesn't have, well, in general, when someone doesn't have what they need, when we're thinking about this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Food is like a basic need. And so when, when, when someone doesn't have that, then they're just not able to potentiate. They're not able to, to, to even strive or thrive in, a, in, in just basic human potentiation, right? And so how does that impact their mental health? How, when someone has to begin to ration food, how does that impact how, how they have a relationship around food, right? Um, I had a conversation with a, a brilliant clinical psychologist a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about, you know, when we're screening for food for food insecurity, um, there's like this chicken and egg phenomenon where we're uh, working with folks with who are experiencing extreme hunger, right? There's a difference between food insecurity um, and hunger. Hunger is this, you know, is that somatic feeling, right, in your body where you are experiencing you have to eat. You're, you're experiencing hunger. Your body is saying to your brain, I, I need to eat. Um, and so when we're working with folks that are experiencing hunger and, and prolonged exposure to hunger, right, what have, how, what have they begun to learn over time in order to survive hunger? And how might that, in, in a way, impact once they get some type of uh, access to more regular food, how might they begin to learn, how might they learn over time um, how to eat in, in a way, meaning do they still ration their food? Um, do they do they not eat consistently because they've been exposed to, to prolonged hunger, this form of trauma over time, right? So what are the mental health impacts of hunger over time? How, how are frontline organizations working and responding to folks who have been exposed to this form of trauma over time, both in children and adults? And what are we doing to help folks in, in that particular way? But then also just with, in, in children, how does not having the type of nutrition that you need for a child 
impact their cognitive development, their learning, right? How are teachers responding to children who are in experiencing food insecurity in the classroom, right? How are they assessing any type of uh, behavioral impact, right? on a child who is food insecure? And what is the school's reaction and response to that um, as well? So there's a, there's a lot there. Are there any um, misconceptions that you've come across in your work um, around food insecurity? I think one of the misconceptions that our team specifically has come across is that food insecurity has a specific look. Um, you know, that there's a phenotype associated and through the various um, community events that we've um, supported and, you know, through the work that we do alongside our, com our community-based organization partners, um, we're seeing that food, we, we see, we know that food insecurity, there is no phenotype to it. Um, and that you know you cannot judge a book by its by their cover, um, and so we, as we're developing different programs and thinking through resources that we need, that we are um, you know providing our customers, we want to make sure that it's reaching a wide demographic um, of those that we're serving. I agree with Jillian. Um, the the stereotype that someone who is food insecure is thin. Um, so, uh, individual that it has been exposed to uh, prolonged hunger is thin. Um, that someone who is overweight or obese is not hungry. Um, also, that when we're thinking about um, uh, the way that our charitable, um, like food pantries and things operate that someone who is food insecure and goes to get free food should just be happy with what they get. Um, and so therefore, um, I guess the point that I'm making is that someone that is food insecure should just, they should just be happy with what they get. Um, and so if they're vegan, vegetarian, if they have certain types of um, specialty needs, like they're gluten sensitive, um, if they were to receive, you know, a, a bag of free food and they're like, Hey, I can't eat this. Then they're ungrateful versus having a specialty food need. Right. Um, and so this idea that food insecurity should be somebody that's just happy with what they have and that their you know, body type and body size looks a certain way. Um, also, economically, um, we've seen this all the time, um, and especially during COVID, that someone who is food insecure um, should look economically a certain way, right? Where you know, there's so many people who we categorize as the working poor. Right. And we know groceries are very expensive with inflation and things like that. And so food insecurity is so diverse. It looks so different. Right. Um, and so really removing this idea of what it looks like and meeting people where they are with their their nutrition needs, with their food needs, is really like how we can better tackle um, nutri both nutrition equity and food security. And what are some policies on a federal, state, or local level um, that have had a beneficial or detrimental impact in terms of food insecurity? So the work that we do through Amazon Access, we our, our team was re really started um, around you know building out the ability for customers to you who use um the supplemental nutrition access program snap to be able to use those benefits online for grocery shopping and so um when we looked at a recent report from the usda about 56 percent of food insecure households in the survey reported that in its previous month they participated in one of the um federal nutrition assistance programs so whether it's snap with national school lunch program. Um, and so specifically for SNAP, we know that SNAP improves food, food security. 
offering benefits for families to purchase healthier foods, allows them to free up resources that be, can be used for other health promoting activities or medical care. Um, SNAP is associated with improved current um, as well as long-term health and it's linked to reduce healthcare costs as well. Um, and so we for Amazon and Amazon Access specifically believe our success and scale bring broad responsibility. So that's why like the last few years, we've really been ramping up our SNAP EBT payment acceptance, um, working really closely with the USDA on that. We are really proud that it's now available to those eligible nationwide. So no matter where customers are in the US, um, they can you know, shop groceries using amazon.com and where available, Amazon Fresh and Whole Foods using their SNAP EBT benefits. Nice, nice. Um, I would say there's there's a, a few um, things, there's things that, that are in the pipeline, things currently out now, both at the state and federal level. Um, at the state level, I always have to give a shout out to um, New Jersey's um, NJEDA Economic Development Authority. They have done a really good job in really thinking of ways to connect the private uh, the private sector, public sector, with, um, you know, thinking about innovatively on how the state can address food security. And one of their uh, newest uh, funding opportunities is called, or their newest projects is called the Fridge Program. And essentially, it's putting, uh, uh, how do I describe this? Fridges, we'll just say fridges, in groceries, um, uh, supermarkets, and what this does is allow it allow folks who have who can use their SNAP benefits to kind of pre order their groceries, put it in a fridge, and then after work or whenever they can go and pick up their groceries. And the reason why this is important is because when we're thinking about food security, there's a lot of different things that can impact someone being food insecure. Things like transportation, um, getting to the grocery during certain hours, and things like that. And so the fridge program it allows folks to be able to get their groceries, store them, and then in a public in a in a fridge locker, go and get their groceries during the time that works for them when they can get there. And so it's trying to again reduce a barrier to getting produce and and food that is nutritious and right for them meeting them when there are where they are during times that work for them um also there is a um uh some legislation that is has brought together a bunch of organizations really led by DoorDash and a couple of other um delivery um organizations uh what, one thing we learned during covid is that what are some other things that impact food security? We have seniors, we have folks that live in rural communities that cannot get the food that they need, particularly pre-made meals because of where they are, because of cost, all the things. And so we learned during COVID that partnering with restaurants, partnering with uh, pantries and congregate locations and using private sector organizations like DoorDash and Uber worked wonders in helping our seniors, our homeless folks, people in shelter get the food that they need. And so now moving this legislation forward in really having a national approach in delivering pre-made meals, produce, things like that to seniors um, and to anybody else that needs them, particularly in rural communities and other communities, um, would be a godsend to food, folks that are food insecure. So if that gets passed, that will be um, legislation, I think, around, um, I think, 13 or $15 million that would really scale up how we can get things like produce, meals, and other essential items and things like that. Um, to folks that are in hard to reach areas um, where they don't have to think about it, we can we can partner with places like DoorDash and, and um, Uber as well. Um, and then here also in Hudson County, during COVID, um, a task force was created. Um, now it's been formalized through Hudson County's um, Office of uh, Health Equity. One, a person that they hired, which is amazing, is a food security navigator. And her job um, is to navigate, is to make sure, one thing we learned after doing a survey of the entire county is that the residents here said 
we don't know what we don't know. We don't know where we can go and roll and snap. We don't know where food pantries are. We don't, we don't know of about organizations where we can get meals and food and produce. We don't even know when the farmer's market's open. And so we said, we need somebody who can be the, the hub of information and also make sure that information is spread out across the county so that people can get what they need. And so here in Hudson County, that navigator, our food security navigator, Chloe, her job is to make sure that education and resources about anything and every, everything food security is easily accessible across the county. And so that was over the course of two years of think tanking and things like that. And then we were able to create this office and now have a food security navigator. So I think the county here did a really good job in, in really strategizing and then us implementing um, a person in office. We've had a couple of questions regarding um, food waste. And one of the questions is around legislation. Um, so is there any legislation being introduced um, in this particular question they're uh, asking about package labeling, but I'd like to expand that. Is there any legislation that you're aware of that is seeking to address food waste? Um, I, I know that this has come up, um, I think in a previous webinar regarding, you know, even grocery stores and the discarding of food. Um, and so can you speak about the correlation or relationship um, if you believe there is one regarding food insecurity and food waste, and if there is any program or legislation that you're aware of that might be seeking to address it. I can, I can take this one. So, uh, you know, with, I know that with the, uh, with the big box grocery stores that like Walmart, Trader Joe's, Wegmans, they do have programs that partner with pantries that allow pantries to pick up their less than fresh food um, to then be able to distribute um, through their pantries to folks that are food insecure. Um, and so that is one way. Um, the pantries do have to register with the, the supermarkets and such. Um, that is one way that we see like the Trader Joe's, the Wegmans, the Walmarts, the Whole Foods being able to uh, uh, take what they they see as less than fresh and be able to dis, dis, dispatch it and disseminate it to folks that are food insecure and be able to do that as fast as possible. Now, I'm not sure if this person's question is, hey, are the folks that receive that food that are food insecure, are they eating it? What's happening with it? Um, but I think that is, you know, uh, a, a good relationship between sustainability of food pantries and our food pantries being frontline for folks that are, for pantries that are right in the community serving folks that they know that need food and working with, you know, the Walmarts and the Wegmans of the world. And a lot of that work is also, you know, Feeding America is, you know, is very much so supporting some smaller organizations and working with those that are doing food recovery. And I can't speak to any specifics, but, you know, we are keeping an eye on different policies um, that may surface to help incentivize the diversion of um, food surplus into human consumption and supporting some of those smaller organizations, um, as well as like the larger Feeding America network. Um, that we work, we donate food into. Um, so looking at that closely. Um, we got two uh, just quick clarifying questions. Uh, what is the initiative with Uber and DoorDash in rural areas called? Um, if you could share the name of that, or if you're aware of the initiative, what the name is. I um, the name escapes me, um, but I can I can send it to you after. Yeah. Send yeah. it to me and I'll send it out. Um, and also the other question was, uh, what organization does the Food Navigator work for? Uh, the County of Hudson. So yes. Hudson County. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, you've both uh, talked about some really incredible programs and initiatives. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give some space in case there were any others that you wanted to to chat about and raise awareness of. Well, can you, I think, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Julie. No, you're good. 
I was just going to bring up, I know we just touched on like current policies and Dr. Carter, you brought up some policies that were coming down the pipeline. Just wanted to add one more um, as it pertains to SNAP EBT. So one of the things that we're looking really closely at is, you know, making online SNAP EBT a permanent program under this next farm bill. Um, right now it's still, and it's, it's still pilot. Um, and so we want to make sure that the continuation of not only SNAP EBT, but also summer EBT. Um, so those are things that we're we're looking at closely and um, are hoping will be incorporated into this next farm bill. Um, I mean, I there's a, a couple of other, I mean, things that I can always mention. I think, um, you know, I always like to amplify the importance of farmers markets. I think farmers markets are, are critical, are, life-saving and our front line. Um, these are, you know, your everyday farmer's markets that truly are uh, disruptive in being spaces of food security right in the community. And so uh, wherever, whenever, you know, a, a collective of, of folks and farmers can, um, and community members can, you know, start a farmer's market um, th those are amazing uh, initiatives in order to uh, reverse food security within the community. Um, you know, I always have to give a shout out to Coalition. I mean, Coalition is, um, we have some pretty innovative programs, but I guess to get to the question around food waste, one thing that Coalition does is that we do have a tech program where we, uh, to make a long story short, we, we use RFID tags on our food items in order to track um, within our community fridges what people are eating, how often they transact in the fridge in order to restock the fridges every week per that community location. So for us, we use a lot of technology in order to stem food waste. So for our community fridge program, we don't just like put any old food in the fridge. We partner with local restaurants and food operators. And then we literally track those transactions for free to, to say, oh, we know that this location only needs this much food down to the millisecond. So that way there isn't food waste um, or any type of overflow of food. Um, so for us, we're very mindful of food waste. Um, we also give people exactly what they want. So that way there isn't that kind of leftover type of thing. Um, so I just want to um, just put a little asterisk to that because I do understand what that question to asking around food waste. Um, yeah. I want to piggyback on the mention of farmers markets um, and just their importance. And when Dr. Cardi mentioned farmers markets, it made me think about uh, the work that's being done um, through like the USDA's Gusnick program to support double up food bucks programs, nutrition incentive programs. Um, and other programs that really ladder up to, you know, food, this large food as medicine movement. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, at those, those double up food bucks really started yeah. right, in the farmer's market space yeah. where, yeah. Um, you know, you can go and extend your, the dollars that you're spending or on produce and really excited to see um, the furthering of that work um, in brick and mortar retail. We just, uh, the last two years have been working really closely with the Washington State Department of Health um, in the city of Baltimore to expand these nutrition incentive, SNAP incentive programs um, online. So we're really excited about that work. So for example, in Washington state, when customers spend $10 on eligible fruits and vegetables, so it's fruits and vegetables with no added salt, sugar, or fat, um, they get 10 more dollars um, mm -hmm. to spend in their next purchase of fruits and vegetables. And in Baltimore City, they're using GusNIP dollars and ARPA funds um, to provide customers who make a $5 purchase at the beginning of the month um, with $30 to spend on uh, fresh frozen and canned fruits and vegetables. So really excited to see programs like that. And there's programs, there's program models like that all across the country. So yeah. encouraging um, anyone, you know, to really look into what opportunities there are for community members that we're serving in your specific area. Yep. The um the Newark Conservancy, um, which is three acres of farm in Newark, super beautiful. They have the that exact model for Newark residents. Um and it's 
absolutely beautiful. Um, if you're a new work resident, they I'm not sure if it's like ten dollars or five dollars, but you can register for um, your produce box. And let's just I I'm I'm going I think it is ten dollars, but you register for your produce box. Um, and I believe it's like ten dollars, and then you get that the double like the the yeah. produce book double up um, during their during their season. I think their season just closed out or closes out next week, um, and then they start back up in April. And the beautiful thing with the newer conservancy is that it all comes from local uh, local growers, so it's that farmer ecosystem farm to table model. Um, and yeah. so, like you said, there's models all across the nation um so yeah 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 produce boxes just the spin and earn where maybe you know a one to one dollar match or like five dollars ten dollars um yeah it's i'm really excited to see the growth of these types of programs to help extend extend um individuals snap budgets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and bringing local farmers into a a a model of entrepreneurship, particularly Black farmers. Yeah. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, many of our affiliates have been working for a long time on addressing food insecurity in their communities on the ground, um, and we always love to hear other ideas, new ideas for how we can address this. And so. Um, what is, you know, one thing, for example, that NUL uh, could do to address inequities in their communities on the ground? I think you've spoken about some programs that perhaps um, could be built upon or partner with, um, but I wanted to get your thoughts about that. It can only be one thing. <laughs> if you have more ideas, I don't want to stop you, but <laughs> go ahead. Um, you know, I, I, um, I feel like there's multiple things that the the first thing I'd say is that um, one thing that we didn't talk about is is safety and you know food security is also about feeling safe in your community feeling safe um, getting to and accessing uh, spaces of healthful nutrition and uh, the example I bring up is. Um, the grocery store in Buffalo, where, um, what was it, unfortunately, 10 individuals were murdered um, by a mass shooter um, in Buffalo, New York. The community had advocated for that grocery store. The, that grocery store was in a food desert and had disrupted that space of apartheidism when the grocery store um, was built. And so when we're thinking about food insecurity, um, food insecurity, food security, we also have to think about that there can be a location that provides helpful nutrition, um, but the community and individuals have to be safe accessing that space, right? It has to be a space of safety, care, community, belonging, and dignity. And so I would say that affiliates, one thing that affiliates can do is use their political voice, their political power, um, to advocate for policy, for legislation, for change, in order to create just that spaces of belonging, care, and safety um, for individuals to access healthful nutrition um, within their community, if it exists, or to bring those spaces to their community that is in a way that is good and right for, for residents. I think from the lens of uh, Amazon, you know, we, our team, we really believe it's important to start with our customers. So in the case of like food access, health equity, We've done this by working closely with community-based organizations and others with boots on the ground to really understand communities' needs. Um, we don't wanna make any assumptions on the role we can play. So that's why our relationship with the National Urban League and the affiliate chapters is so important, it's so vital because we wanna make sure we're innovating and offering, you know, continuing to offer programs and resources that make it, um, you know, better, that, make easy, make it easier 
um, more affordable, more accessible to shop across Amazon. And we're really addressing what community members need the most. Um, but we also need your help to build awareness of that. Um, and so, you know, we, the last few years, have launched a community access program where we have really, you know, dug deep in communities across Washington, D.C., Houston, Dallas, Miami, Los Angeles, um, New York, and Atlanta. And we want to continue to further that work. Um, and so, you know, we would love to continue to partner with the National Urban League and its affiliate chapters. Um, other ways, you know, that we believe that NUL can um, continue to further this work is by reinforcing those USDA programs that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, making sure that we're supporting community members with not only, you know, utilizing their SNAP benefits, but there's a large number of community members who are eligible but unenrolled. And so we've been working with community-based organizations or CBOs to help, you know, raise awareness and get people enrolled in SNAP so that they're not leaving any dollars on the table that they're eligible for. Um, I know that National Urban League has an MOU um, with the USDA. And so I would encourage, you know, affiliate chapters to figure out how they can ladder up to the larger strategy um, that will, that's being or will be rolled out with the USDA. One of the USDA programs that I get really excited about is the MyPlate program, which helps to guide consumers on how to build a balanced plate. So, you know, you know, incorporating fruits and vegetables, making sure half your plate is, you know, fruits and vegetables, you know, a quarter of your plate is grains and your, a quarter of your plate is proteins to really build balance and push the messaging that all foods fit, all foods fit, um, but it's just, you know, how you build your plate that um, really matters. And so thinking about how you can support, you know, support the community members you're serving with building balance throughout their day, um, using my plate messaging as one of the USDA programs. And so those are just some some thoughts that come top of mind for me. Um, in your current work or previous work or in the work that you know others are doing in this space, what are some of the current challenges that are being faced? Um, and how are they being addressed? I think awareness is one. And I think Dr. Carter touched on this, right? Um, you know, for many communities, it's, there's programs available, but it's knowing about those programs, you know, whether it's knowing about the farmer's market hours or knowing, you know, that you're eligible for a double up food bucks program, um, knowing what resources may be available. And so I think organizations, whether it is supporting a uh, a community lead, as Dr. Carter, you know, described earlier, or, you know, someone to really take ownership of that, or for the organization as a whole to take ownership of that, but, you know, doing the work for the communities, right, that we're serving, and making sure that we are aggregating what is available, um, and then spreading the word, um, spreading the word about that, so I think awareness is, is a huge one, a huge barrier, a huge gap that we've seen especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when, you know, just before 2019, you couldn't use SNAP benefits online. And so one of the reasons our community engagement program was launched is because we saw that, hey, this was rolled out, you could use it, but there was lack of awareness um, on the ability to do so. And so we're really grateful for the partnerships with National Urban League and others on raising awareness on SNAP and other programs that are available more locally for community members. And I think that um, also really fortifying local grassroots organizations as well. Um, you know, I think a, a, a major challenge is sustainability of our frontline folks. We see frontline organizations, and that includes farmers markets, frontline organizations and groups that are right there. They're the ones that are, you know, work you know, meeting the needs of the community. They're the ones doing doing SNAP enrollment. They're the ones that are listening to our to our our residents. They're the ones that see exactly what's happening on the front line every day um, in crisis with our community, right? Um, yet those are the ones that are most underfunded, right? Those are also the ones that tend to be led by our BPOC leaders. Um, and typically BPOC women leaders. And so they tend to have the, the, the hardest uh, 
they tend to they tend to be most challenged with uh, financial sustainability um, and just being able to fortify their infrastructure that continue to do the work to meet the needs, right? And so we really see a lot of, um, you know, we see organizations come and go. Um, we see them not being able to be consistent. And so this is a huge issue within the work of food security because we need to, to, to be able to keep those organizations fortified, consistent, and sustainable in order for the families and the children and the community to, to know that that organization is going to be there for them whenever they need it um, in order for their needs to be met. And actually, in order to scale their program to provide all the different wraparound needs that they that an individual needs, right? Because we we talked about it's not just it's not just food, it's employment, it's housing, it's all these it's mental health, it's all these things, right? We need to be able to provide them that those wraparound infrastructure needs in order to actually meet our black families where they are. So to me, that's that's the 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 crux there um, is to fortify those organizations. Yeah, I was building capacity to ensure longevity is, mm -hmm. yeah, totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, and both of you have mentioned uh, COVID. I know, Dr. Carter, that your organization started right at the beginning of the pandemic. We were just chatting about that before we started. Um, and then, uh, Ms. Griffith, you also talked about um how policy changes allowed folks to be able to get to be able to use uh, services and benefits online. Um, what are some other changes that you've seen happen during COVID that you either hope will be sustained or that you're already seeing being sustained? You know, the the interesting thing with COVID is that um, within that crisis allowed for experimentation and change. You know, uh, the world did not have what what food justice advocates had been saying, this is we need to do this, we need to do this, right? Beforehand, when a global crisis came, state and federal government said, well, let's try it, right? Because we didn't have time to, to think about it anymore, for better or for worse. They just said, hey, let's try it. And so there was experiment experimentation and then and then change happened with, you know, these different um, now, you know, wanting to fortify home delivery and, you know, um, online use of SNAP and expanding what SNAP can be can be used for and, and things like that. And so I think that and then also, you know, even with, you know, the NJEDA, you know, uh, and their sustain and serve program supporting local restaurants and their fridge program, um, also the NJEDA uh, just recently, uh, they, it's, it's closed now, but had a grant program where municipalities uh, needed to find a nonprofit organization to partner with in order to transform vacant land into some type of uh, uh, initiative that would uh, support food, um, food security. Um, so that could be you're turning it into a garden, you're turning it into some type of garden or urban farm or something like that. But it has to be focused on food security within a food desert location. Um, and so uh, I think that inside of all this, one, it opened everyone's eyes to one, the epidemic of hunger and food insecurity that is within our nation. And second, that all of this innovation and all of this need that we actually can address it and and let's just let's just go ahead and move let's just move and and do it so i think we're beginning to see how we can actually cement and institutionalize these innovative policies and practices and legislation for longevity around food security we're we're only i think what a year out of covid so i think we're still there's still some legislation that's like on the floor that we're waiting to get institutionalized, right? Um, but I think once we get into 2024 and 2025, we're going to see a lot of that kind of really cemented um, uh, nationally and, and within individual state government. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And to circle back on a point that Dr. Carter, you made earlier around 
the impact of hunger, food insecurity on children, um, students, and you know uh, their learning pathway. One of the things that was that was launched um, or supported during the pandemic was um, summer EBT, pandemic EBT. And yep. so we're really excited to see the continuation of that, um, of pandemic EBT into summer EBT um, next year in summer of 2024. And so, you know, those programs like that, that close the, close the hunger gap when kids are on summer break um, and not getting, you know, nutritious meals at school, which we know many students rely on, we want to see the continuation of those types of programs. Um, also, you know, the continued expansion of universal school meals. So we work closely with organizations like No Kid Hungry, I'm So Sure Our Strength, um, who, you know, are really advocating for universal school meals and the expansion of that, because um, school meals improve test scores, right? They improve the health of students. Um, they help, you know, they help to scale up graduation rates. And so those are things that I think there's a lot of learnings around, a lot of success around, um, you know, the pandemic and that we're hopeful to see as permanent programs as well as staff, online staff. Mm -hmm. And please feel free to, to submit your questions. You can do so in the Q&A box and thank you to the folks who have submitted questions so far. Um, one of the things that I think um, sometimes gets overlooked in these conversations are success stories or successes. You know, I asked about challenges and I, I'd love to hear, you know, in the work that you're doing, what are some things that you've seen be really successful? Um, and that could be a program, an initiative, your own work, someone else's, um, but what are some of these successes that you've seen in programs and initiatives? I'll, I think so. One of the programs that's close to my heart, um, as, as I mentioned before, is the um, online expansion of nutrition incentive programs. And so um, programs like SNAP Produce Much, SNAP Produce Match, um, that incentivize SNAP recipients to, you know, consume health, consume fruits and vegetables. We are seeing, you know, for the first time, like people's customers shopping with us. Um, are buying fruits and vegetables. And so we know that fruit and vegetable consumption also helps to lower, re um, lower reduce risk or, you know, roll back on the onset of chronic disease. So I'm, that's one of the things that I'm really excited um, and really happy that we've been able to support it um, in Washington State and Baltimore this past year. I mean, I, uh, I have a few, but, you know, I sprinkled it all throughout the conversation, but, um, you know, to re-summarize, you know, one, I always have to give a shout out to the County of Hudson um, and, and to specify it's the County of Hudson's Health and Human Services Division within their Office of Health Equity. I hope I got that right. right. I saw that Chloe Camp Campiglia um, is on the line. And she she's our, our food security navigator. Um, I think that I, you know I think her position is a huge success for us um, because you know she uh, really she navigates she makes sure that you know everyone throughout the county uh, that we're we're doing our job in making sure that the county can get resources and information out to our county residents and that was a seed that was planted and nourished during COVID. Um, and so I think that it's just a good display of how a coalition of people under the director um, of health and human services at the county were, were able to come together and get something done, right? Because we always talk about how government can't get things done, but you know, we got something done um, in the county. And so, and and Chloe is a is an amazing human human being. So I think that's one success. I think all of the work at the NJEDA that includes their fridge program, that neighborhood revitalization program, and their sustain and serve program, all excellent examples of how the state's economic development authority really saw how you can have food security is an economic justice issue and how they can take up the mantle of addressing food security as a state agency. Um, and so their programs to me are all um, uh, success stories. Um, also at the, in the, in New Jersey, um, New Jersey's Department of Health, we partner with them. We have a program called Eating Better Together where we combine how do we reverse poor oral hygiene in children 
through a food security and helpful nutrition perspective. So we provide children who might have poor oral hygiene with helpful nutrition uh, for six weeks, uh, nutrition counseling, health resources for the children and the family in order to reverse poor oral hygiene and, and increase nutrition literacy and media literacy around nutrition. Um, of course, I think so many things that the city of Newark is doing around uh, produce boxes, farmers markets, creating a growers network that is really bridging farm to table for families that are food insecure and, and helping them stretch their dollar. I just think the city of Newark is really ahead of the game as a city um, really doing that. Um, and then FRAC, which is the Food Research and Action Center, um, I think they're amazing. They actually um, just launched a, uh, I, I don't know if we call it a collaboratory, it's an initiative. It's an initiative where they've brought together multiple stakeholders in the food security um, network to launch a funding opportunity to fortify and to cultivate grassroots organizations, particularly BPOC ones, who are front lines doing food security work to help really, you know, build sustainability on the front line there. Um, and so FRAC to me is really, it's really thought about, and that comes out of, you know, uh, eight month long think tank um, around how do we do better with fortifying those local grassroots initiatives. Um, and then I always have to toot our horn um, at coalition with the work we do around food access, innovation, and technology. So I see that we're we're nearing the end of time, but I'd love to hear from each of you if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share. For me, just thank you for the opportunity to be able to connect with this audience. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with the National Urban League and the affiliate chapters to further the work that's being done on the ground um, to address food access and food insecurity. Um, and so, yes, all more to come. And I echo um, Jillian's sentiments. Um, it was a pleasure being on the panel. Um, thank you for amplifying the importance of both food security access um, as a health equity, um, a critical health equity um, topic. Um, and, you know, I just hope that you all continue the conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I am so appreciative, as I'm sure our audience is, of this conversation. And yes, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. And I'm sure that everyone who's joined today is as well. And thank you also for taking time out of your day to join us for this webinar. I'll be in touch soon about our last webinar of 2023. The time has really flown by. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, yes, and so thank you. Thank you everyone again. And I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care now. <laughs>